All right. Good morning, everybody. Numbers are over 300 and still ticking up. So I'll crack on with the uh, introduction now. Uh, and anyone who joins late will just miss me. They won't miss the important part. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our latest in-house in focus seminar with our data protection uh, update. It's proving a very popular topic and it's always something worth reminding ourselves about the, the state of play. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, please, uh, Paul. Um, I'm Simon Pedley. I'm one of the, the partners at Mills and Reeve. I'm just chairing this event. I'll introduce our two speakers in a moment. Uh, it is going to be recorded, so there will be a recording available afterwards. If you enjoyed it so much, you want to watch it again, pass it on to your friends and family, and everyone will have a lovely time watching it. Um, questions as we go through, please do those via the Q&A box, not via chat. I'll talk about chat in a second. Um, we'll get to as many as we can of the questions at the end. Uh, but if we don't have time to get to any question, we will do our best to follow up. Now, there is an option on Q&A to uh, make yourself anonymous when asking a question. You're very free to, to do that, of course. Uh, if you do that, however, uh, and we don't get your question, we won't be able to follow up with you. So the, the choice is the choice is yours. It's important for us to to deliver topics which, you know, the in-house community actually uh, want to listen to. And, and this has proved to be one of those. So we're just going to do a quick poll in a second, open it for, for 30 minutes. We've got a list of topics and I'd greatly welcome you spending that little bit of time uh, just to click on uh, options for things you would like to see. If there's nothing there that appeals to you and you'd rather do something else, then um, the chat function will be open now briefly and will be open again at the end. It won't be open uh, during the uh, the whole seminar. And there will be a, a form you can fill in at the end when you log off the seminar. And again, you can give your feedback as to topics. But uh, there's a list of topics there. You're all voting away, which is uh, fabulous. Well, Creeping up, I'll give you 10 seconds more to, to cast your vote, and then we will uh, stop this poll. We've had at least about 80% of you have now responded. Well, I, I won't share the results, but we will rest assured we will take it all into account. So this seminar is going to last about 30 to 35 minutes. If we, we move on uh, to the next slide, let me introduce our, our speakers. Um, today, we have got uh, Paul Knight, who's a technology and commercial law partner who that has a particular focus on data protection. And we've got Claire Williams, a principal associate who deals with contentious data matters. Uh, I will hand over to them. I believe it's Claire who's going first. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Simon. So today we've got four topics to talk to you about. I will be starting off by giving you a quick canter through the reasonable enforcement action in relation to data. Um, and then Paul will be continuing explaining the trends in apportioning data protection risks under contracts what the EU to US adequacy decision means for UK organisations, and of course, giving you an update on the data protection and digital information number two bill and how that's progressing. Next slide, please. But first of all, enforcement. For those of you who do occasionally peruse the enforcement section of the Information Commissioner's website, you will no doubt have noticed that there has been a notable lack of fines handed out by the Commissioner in relation to the UK GDPR. This is actually in sharp contrast with the volume of fines and activity related to things like unsolicited marketing, which neatly demonstrates that for the majority of companies, it's not the GDPR that has been the main cause of regulatory risk so far. In a moment, I will talk through the lessons from the notice published this year, that of TikTok. But first, I should mention that the Information Commissioner's Office has recently been on a recruitment drive. Increases in the size of the enforcement department are projected and expected. And those employees will, of course, all need something to do. That, combined with the changes to the rules on fines, which means the ICO can now retain a certain percentage of fines, means that companies need to be on their toes when it comes to data governance. With the switch to a very heavy use of reprimands for public authorities rather than fines, which we will also talk about, the headline grabbing figures are going to be imposed on private companies. So first, TikTok. <clears throat> for anyone who doesn't know, TikTok is a video-based social media platform where the world and his wife can share their thoughts, feelings, and intimate life details with the general population, often in the form of dance. TikTok processes quite a lot of its users' personal data, from basic details to platform settings, likes, profiles, and also information collected via surveys and competitions. Processing includes internal user profiles for targeting likes and dislikes, 
those profiles that, as we know, can only funnel people towards their favorite type of content to keep them online and engaged. TikTok provided services to children under the age of 13. Now, we all know that children readily ignore age restrictions, and they did not seek or obtain the consent of parents or guardians for that. And as you will know from your undoubted familiarity with the GDPR and the guidance on dealing with children, that was not appropriate. TikTok did try to avoid a penalty on the basis of um, saying its lawful basis for processing was contractual necessity. And so that would have actually helped its position if it could have made that argument out. But in short, the ICO considers that it would be an overreach on the meaning of what is necessary. TikTok also failed in its obligations under Articles 13 and 14 of the GDPR, being the obligation to provide information to individuals in a clear and intelligible format about how their data will be collected, processed and generally used. Clearly for children, you have to make it a bit more kid friendly. And TikTok did not. As set out on the slide, TikTok received a £12,700,000 fine from the ICO. More recently, over the weekend, you may have spotted that another fine was announced for TikTok, this time by the Irish Data Protection Commission. The Irish regulator has decided to impose a fine of €345 million, Euros, clearly demonstrating that the EU is not messing around when it comes to enforcement, and it does also make the €12.7 million fine issued by the ICO look a bit paltry by comparison. Lessons, however, from the, the ICO penalty notice are very clear. The first is be extremely careful if you offer services to or which are potentially accessible by those under 13. We all know they get access to social media, competitions and events. So watch out for that and implement appropriate safeguards. Two, always consider the need for parental consent. Children are not competent to make their own decisions as much as they wish they were. And legal caregivers should not be excluded or worked around. And three, privacy notices aren't static documents to be published and then preserved in ASPIC for all time. They are living documents that need to be continually reviewed and adapted. They also do matter and they are incredibly important if you want to be able to respond to data complaints and to demonstrate you have behaved adequately and appropriately. The regulator will want to see your privacy notices and you will repeatedly need to quote from them. So if you haven't dusted yours off for a short while, now is an excellent time. Moving on, we have a blast from the past. If you recall, way back in 2019, the first fine under the GDPR of a normal, everyday sort of company, the kind you generally wouldn't find gracing the pages of a newspaper, was published. And the lucky company was Doorstep Dispensary, a pharmacy. In short, Doorstep routinely processed sensitive special category data. They supply medicine to care homes and, quite frankly, had not been keeping on top of the security and ultimately the, de the destruction of the many documents involved in their work. The Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulation Authority executed a search warrant against Doorstep for unrelated reasons. And while they were there, they discovered almost 50 unsealed crates of documents containing personal data were being held in a courtyard accessible by third parties. Many of the documents were soaking wet as well, indicating they'd been open to the element for quite some time. So naturally, not ideal. And the MHRA decided to report that to the ICO. Agreed failings between Doorstep and the ICO included their failure to provide information to data subjects, so back to those privacy notices, and a failure to have up-to-date data governance policies and procedures in place. The ICO fined Doorstep £275,000, which amount was reduced from £400,000 initially proposed. The reduction was on the basis of Doorstep's financial situation. But that fine was a massive increase as compared to historic fines under the previous regime, where 400,000 was reserved for the most egregious of breaches. So many thought the case ended there, but they were wrong. In August of this year, the Upper Tribunal published its decision in relation to an appeal by Doorstep against the Information Commissioner's decision. Doorstep had clearly put in as many challenges as possible, so the decision is very wide ranging and an explosion of various legal concepts, but it does have the benefit for us of making clear some quite important points. First of all, fines imposed by the ICO are civil in nature and the civil standard of proof, meaning the extent to which wrongdoing must be proven, is the civil standard of balance of probability. 
that's what applies. Knowing whether fines are civil or criminal can be relevant to your insurance cover for one thing. Two, where data processes are being used by a data controller, it is extremely important to have a clear and appropriate data processing contract in place. It's also important that controllers monitor the compliance of processes with the contract. It's no good ignoring issues or closing your eyes to them as you can't easily make a case that the processor's actions should not be your responsibility. Doorstep couldn't point a finger at their processor who was hired for destroying documents and say it's their fault. Doorstep retained control and responsibility unless the processor was acting so far out of bounds of their instructions that they could actually be said to have become a controller in their own right. Third, this case actually provides a little bit of guidance on the data protection principle concerning retention of identifiable data. Most of the personal data in the case was over two years old, which given there was no actual ongoing use for the data, the tribunal clearly felt that was far, far, far too long. The case did also demonstrate that there can be value in challenging the amount of a fine imposed. Doorstep did actually succeed in reducing the amount we paid down to £92,000. I cannot, however, comment on the amount it cost them in legal and other fees to achieve that result. Next slide, please. So that's essentially the news when it comes to fines. But as I mentioned, the Information Commissioner has not been twiddling its thumbs. It has, in fact, been very active when it comes to reprimands. So for those who are not so familiar with the change in enforcement direction, the ICO has taken the view that fining public authorities is not a particularly useful approach. Money used to pay fines originates usually from Treasury in any event, and the main impact of the fines is to reduce public services because they can't be paid for or increase local tax burdens. Continually and publicly fining public authorities is unlikely to be conducive to public support of the ICO, and the last thing the ICO needs is sufficient numbers of people turning against data regulation. So that would dispel, dispel disaster in the long term. So as such, we have reprimands, and they act as a public telling off. But they do have an added bonus in that they genuinely provide relevant and useful guidance as to how data should be handled in order to achieve best practice and stay within the rules. They are actually worth a read. The Thames Valley Police were reprimanded because they failed to ensure that officers were aware of existing guidance as to disclosures and redactions. The force was also unable to demonstrate that their personnel who were involved in disclosing contextual information, which caused some suspected criminals to become aware of the address of a witness, had received proper training. The data subject was clearly harmed as they had to move address as a result. Lessons from this reprimand are first that it's no good having policies and procedures in place if you don't actually ensure they're followed. Writing a policy is only half the job and your data governance awareness program is actually very important. And second, your training, including records of that training needs to be good and completion rates have to be monitored. A poor rate of completion of training is actually an aggravating factor for the ICO when determining penalties. In one fine from a few years back, which I think involved British Airways, but don't quote me on that, um, it was an aggravating factor and it caused the fine to be increased. So clearly Thames Valley Police would also have significant litigation risk in this case, and I've not heard of any litigation, but if there was any threatened, I would expect it to have been settled rather than defended in this particular scenario. The Parkside Community Primary School reprimand is a bit vague on the underlying facts, but in essence, it seems that emails containing sensitive information about students and um, some potential some parents were displayed on a whiteboard screen where students could see them. It seems this may have occurred as part of screen sharing as part of a lesson. In addition to the breach, the relevant staff members failed to report the data breach immediately. In that case, again, policies and procedures were in place, but the ICO has pointed out a few useful tips on measures that improve data protection, include consider and implement sensitive and highly sensitive labeling, um, give refresher training to staff where they need it, make sure that they are fully up to date, again, properly track completion of training, and staff need to be properly signposted to reporting routes and assistance, and they should be properly trained on devices and their use. The last one is the biggest takeaway from this reprimand, because it's very easy to assume your staff will just know how your systems work and how to share screens safely, for example, but that's not true. Like everything else, they need to be given clear training and direction or you will get errors. The reprimands for Norfolk County Council and Plymouth County Council are emblematic of the Information Commissioner's essential total loss of patience now with organisations when it comes to responding to subject access requests. 
Simply put, it's not acceptable to only respond to 50% of the requests you receive within a one year period. The time limit is a month. So while the pandemic did have an impact on services and the ICO was willing to be a bit flexible, there are limits. And I should also mention that the ICO is also fed up of failures by public authorities to meet deadlines for freedom of information requests. Uh, we've seen activity in that area and we can expect to see more demands in that area in the future. The beauty of subject access requests, though, is they do follow a process. So once you've worked out how they can be done within your firms, the process can run quite smoothly. And if you do have trouble and you can't handle the review and redactions needed in-house, law firms like Mills and Reeve can help you. The trick here is to be quick off the mark, though, in processing the initial request, because you need to get ahead of the game when it comes to searching for the documents. The reprimand for the Ministry of Justice is focused on data destruction and the need to pay attention to the end point of the data lifecycle. The facts were that prison officers and prisoners had access to 14 bags of confidential information which were left in an unsecured prison holding area. For a whole 18 days, nearly three weeks, they were just left there and were read by people who shouldn't have had access to them. And quite bizarrely, although staff challenged prisoners who read them, they didn't move the bags. So the lesson here is that confidential waste, including that containing personal data, needs to be properly disposed of. It needs to be stored in a safe location and proper destruction policies must be in place. You also need to make it clear to staff that you value data governance and the staff do need to take responsibility for implementing data governance rules. Finally, in July, NHS Lanarkshire was reprimanded for the use by staff members of WhatsApp. Although WhatsApp was not approved by NHS Lanarkshire for processing patient data, at the onset of the pandemic, when staff ceased to be working in the same location, the relevant team did turn to WhatsApp in order to replace the ad hoc casual conversations they'd normally have in the office. Their actions were entirely understandable. They were just trying to do their jobs, but resulted in patient data being processed outside the data security perimeter of the organisation. So the lesson to be learned from this reprimand is the need to anticipate employees' needs. When circumstances change, you do need to be able to roll with them. And the lack of a way to communicate in real time did mean that staff trying to do their jobs caused the data governance issue. So that is our update on enforcement. And now I will hand over to Paul. Thanks, Claire. Just going to move the slides on. Um, so, so bearing everything um, that Claire's talked about in mind, um, we wanted to comment on trends in apportioning data protection risks under contracts that we're seeing, um, not least because uh, there's probably useful information there to take back to your organisations or to use in discussions with other parties you're negotiating with. And in, in this respect, the data processing relationship between the parties influences the approach that tends to be taken, by which I mean um, there are differences in approach depending on whether there is a controller to processor relationship with a processor just acting on behalf of uh, um, on the instruction of the controller, as is common in the customer supplier relationship, or whether the contract involves data sharing on a controller to controller basis, or indeed whether the parties are joint controllers who together jointly determine the purposes and means of the data processing. In the context of, of controller processor contracts, there is a definite trend towards setting a standalone separate cap on the processor's liability to the controller for breach of data protection obligations under the contract. It is also fair to say that we're quite often seeing the processor committing to indemnify the controller against losses um, arising from the processor's breach of its data protection obligations. But such an indemnity is still typically subject to a cap on liability. There's, there's been a move away um, from an expectation that processors, the suppliers, should be prepared to proceed to provide their services without any contractual cap on their potential liability for data protection breaches. And when going down the route of super caps on liability for data protection breaches, the level of this super cap is usually at least a seven figure sum, i.e. it is typically in the millions. We work with clients from a variety of different sectors, 
But one of the things about working with um, central government departments and, and the wider public sector is that we see and follow the positions taken by the Cabinet Office and the Government Legal Department for a number of contracts. And it is breaking no confidences to say that the UK government expectation is that when it is buying services with a value in excess of about 200,000, um, the supplier's uh, potential liability for a breach of data protection obligations is expected to be capped per contract year at an amount between 10 million and 20 million. For lower value contracts, i.e. those uh, below that, about £200,000 figure, which the actual amount of the figure is influenced by the nature of, of the buyer, that there is still an expectation that the supplier will um, agree that its liability for breach of data protection obligations should be between £500,000 and, and £5 million. Pounds. And for those organizations that can make use of the of the G Cloud framework for buying information technology cloud services, such as software as a service or SaaS, it is worth knowing that all tech providers signed up to G Cloud have to agree their data protection liability cap will be 10 million per contract year. And I think that can be um, a useful frame of reference for other organizations looking to contract with SaaS providers too. After all, the, the argument that a, a cap on liability at that level cannot be agreed rather weakens when you know that it's been signed off uh, by a particular tech provider in order to get onto the G Cloud framework. But an, a number of um, major tech providers do not willingly commit to a super cap on data protection liability in their standard terms. On the contrary, uh, liability for breach of data protection obligations is, is often by default caught by, by a general cap on liability under standard terms that get offered by data processors such as SAP or Google or AWS. But our experience is if, if and when you can get into a negotiation with a, with a supplier, a processor, over limitations of liability for breach of data protection obligations, um, the logic of a super cap separate and as a standalone cap is usually understood and that the discussion quickly shifts to the level at which the cap should be set. And when having that type of discussion and negotiating the appropriate apportionment of risk uh, for data protection breaches, relevant factors include things like the volume of data. So the greater the volume, the more risk the customer would naturally expect its supplier to accept, um, i.e. you would expect the cap on the supplier's liability for data protection breaches to be higher if it is processing a large amount of personal data than would be the case if the supplier was only processing a small amount of personal data. And similarly, for, there's the sensitivity of data to consider. So the more sensitive the personal data being entrusted to the supplier to process, the higher the cap on their potential liability if they fail to comply with obligations to keep the data secure is likely to be. Um, where the data is held might influence uh, the, where, the at what level the cap is set. And here, if the, if the data is held outside the UK and outside the EU, a customer might argue for a higher cap on the supplier's liability. And linked to all of the above, the greater the likelihood and the impact of any potential breach, the higher the cap on potential liability could be expected to be. But in addition to factors relevant to the data uh, being processed, it's also appropriate to take into account factors relating to the supplier, the processor. So the, the more established and reliable the processor is understood to be, the more commercially justifiable it is to accept a lower cap on liability for data protection breach. And it's, it's also worth taking into account that the processor's uh, proximity to data subjects when, uh, and whether um, multiple processors are involved in the processing. So typically, if the processor is, is effectively invisible to the data subjects and just one of many processors playing a part in the processing activity, then it may be justifiable for the processor to take on uh, less risk relating to the data protection than 
than would be uh, the case if it was visibly collecting data directly from data subjects on behalf of the controller. Um, and therefore, um, a breach of data protection obligations could potentially lead to liability that the controller may have little opportunity to control or mitigate. You'll see um, cyber insurance is also referred to here. Um, the availability um, of insurance is, is one of those factors to be considered when trying to apply the reasonableness test for exclusions or limitations of liability under the Unfair Contracts Terms Act. And of course, requiring the other party to insure against a certain risk, such as cyber breaches, um, does not in itself influence that other party's liability under the contract for any loss associated with that risk. But the level of insurance available is, is often used to inform where a cap on liability um, is set in the in the contract. And um, on, on this basis, we sort of in, in this context, we've, we've recently seen some comparatively well established uh, tech providers um, Com resist committing to uh, cyber insurance with an indemnity limit of 10 million, um, saying that they operate with cyber insurance uh, with an indemnity limit that's much lower. So in the sort of 2 million to 2.5 million per claim uh, region. When those conversations have cropped up in, you know, over, the, over the summer, our, our clients as, as customers have, have um, due to their respective bargaining positions, been able to still insist on data protection liability cap being set at higher than 2.5 million. But I mentioned this um, because uh, this sort of in-house in focus forum is, is intended for sharing intel that might be useful to the in-house legal community to hear. And I, I think this is one of those things. Now, I mentioned that um, who, that, uh, who accepts what level of risk uh, tends to be um, depend on the nature of the data processing relationship between the parties. In, in a controller to controller uh, data sharing arrangement, it is far more common in our experience to see the parties providing reciprocal indemnities to compensate um, the other party for losses arising out of the indemnifying party's breach of its data protection obligations and for there to be no cap on liability specified. Um, with the, the intention being that party A should not take on any risk associated with party B's breach of data protection obligations and vice versa. This reflects the independence of, of the two parties uh, so far as the data protection legislation is concerned. But in the context of joint controllers, each joint controller can be liable for the entire damage caused by data processing activities, unless it can prove that it's not in any way responsible for the event giving rise to the damage. That means that we're seeing joint controller agreements that say if the ICO um, determines that one of the joint controllers um, is responsible for a data loss event, then that particular joint controller should be liable for liabilities arising from that data loss. But if the ICO does not express a view on this, uh, then the joint controllers shall work together to investigate and allocate responsibility for the resulting liabilities, or by agreement, split the liabilities 50-50 if no responsibility for, data, for the data loss event can be apportioned. Right. Um, Conscious of time, I, I'm going to move on to a couple of quick updates. Um, firstly, uh, you may have picked up that in July, the European Commission adopted um, an adequacy decision for the EU-US data privacy framework, which means that the EU GDPR applies, um, that where the EU GDPR applies, personal data can now flow from the EU to the US companies that are participating in this framework without having to put in place additional protections such as approved standard contractual clauses. That's very helpful for EU GDPR compliance. The point here is it means nothing for those organizations that are trying to comply with the UK GDPR. And I want to make sure everyone's aware of that. So at the moment, the UK is moving slower than the EU, and uh, the most we have here in the UK currently is a commitment in principle to establish the UK extension to the data privacy framework. Uh, 
Apparently, some some further technical work now needs to be completed before the UK can decide whether a solution that works for the EU can work similarly for the UK. But don't worry, that's that's due to be completed in the coming months. Um, not sure this is exactly what Brexit was meant to deliver, but um, hey ho. Um, all this means that as things stand, if you want to carry out a restricted transfer of personal data from the UK to the US and you're subject to the UK GDPR, you will need to uh, either ensure there is an appropriate safeguard in place as allowed for under UK GDPR Article 46, such as using the International Data Transfer Agreement that's published by the ICO after completing an appropriate transfer risk assessment, or you'll need to be able to rely on one of the de derogations for specific circumstances um, that are referred to in UK GDPR Article 49. But um, do keep an eye out for further announcements about the UK extension to the data privacy uh, framework, which will simplify sharing data with the US. And then finally, um, in terms of things we wanted to cover today, I just want to highlight where things stand with the proposed new legislation to reform data protection legislation in the UK. So the, the Boris Johnson government uh, introduced the data protection and digital information bill, um, but that was paused and then withdrawn by Rishi Sunak's government and has been replaced by the data protection and digital information number two bill, um, which commenced its journey through parliament in March. For those that haven't been following this, the, the number two bill is very similar to the original bill um, and outlines amendments that are intended to update, clarify and consolidate some um, concepts and definitions under the UK data protection law. Um, and it makes various other reforms. It also sets out the legislative basis for a new UK digital identity and attributes trust framework the creation and maintenance of a digital verification services register for providers uh, that conform to certain accreditation requirements. It, it allows for an information gateway to um, identify uh, and uh, run eligibility checks that need to be made uh, against data held by public authorities. And it um, sort of introduces this concept of designation of a, of a trust mark that can be used by accredited digital verification service providers that are registered on that on that register I mentioned. It also brings um, the privacy and electronic communications regulations enforcement into line with the UK GDPR maximum fines. Um, and changes the constitution of the data protection regulator so. It is intended that the information commissioner will be replaced by an information commission. We at Mills and Reeve have recently published an overview of the bill as it stands on our website. Um, that overview is called Data Protection Reform Revisited. And I think if you just Google Data Protection Reform Revisited, it should be the, the, at the top of the uh, search results. But um, as you can see from the slide, uh, the bill still has a way to go before it will become law. Um, so the, the Public Bill Committee has completed its work and reported the bill with amendments to the House of Commons, but no date has yet been announced for the bill's report stage and third reading in the Commons. It may be amended further, and it's likely to be sometime next year when it's in its final form, although it does remain to be seen whether the possibility of a general election in 2024 might further impact its implementation. Um, so one of the take home messages today is, is that change is likely on the data protection front um, and so plan for some action being necessary, but not just yet. Right, I can see that there are a, a number of questions in the Q&A. Simon, have you been... Um, monitoring those i i have and and that last section from you paul has prompted a whole flurry of questions so i'll try and uh, group together a few uh themes and stuff and and rest assured to uh, everyone else you know we will try and answer separately if we can't get to you since i don't think we will get to everyone um so one sort of general question was put by one person how does this 
apportionment between controller and processor interplay with Article 82 GDPR? What liability is it specifically looking to cover, given that Article 82 provides direct liability for the defaulting party? And, and a similar question, are regulatory fines recoverable under an indemnity? I understand fines are criminal, and generally a party cannot recover from another party for, for criminal liability. So what are, are these? what liability are these caps there to cover? Yeah, so um, uh, it's good to link those two. So um, I think it is right to say that uh, the ICO is meant to find the party that it deems to be at fault. And therefore, um, there's sort of po public policy reasons why you cannot uh, recover uh, and say, as a control, if you are fined as a controller, um, 10 million pounds, you cannot recover that 10 million pounds from your processor because the ICO has said you are liable for that. That is your level of responsibility. But there are other types of um, loss that might arise from data protection breach. And indeed, uh, things like reputational damage um, crops up as and therefore um, it is that type of liability, those other types of liability that um, parties are concerned about um but I, th I think the acknowledgement that um under the, under the uk gdpr and the eu gdpr that in terms of uh enforcement action by supervisory authorities um it should be the party that is in fault that is receiving the fine has led to this understanding that actually um it is no longer appropriate to expect uh, suppliers, processors to take on um, and accept uncapped liability for data protection breaches. Um, and, and sort of following on from those, one, one person has said, as a controller, we often get pushback from processors saying that, well, since data subjects or the ICO can go to us, the processor directly, if you know if we're in the wrong, we can't accept um, you know the, the super cap you're talking about, and they limit try and limit it much more more heavily what sort of losses would you need again similarly lots of losses would you need to ensure that they can recover direct from the processor and another sort of related question uh, related to claire's slides earlier if if when you do you have to worry about it when you're dealing with public authorities since if they're not going to get fined and they're just going to get reprimanded do you really care as a processor i suppose <laughs> i'll take that last bit first um i mean you with public authorities, yes, this, this shift has gone to reprimands, um, which is a purely practical decision based on finances. Um, but the idea is the reprimand is enough to you know, kick the public authority into shape. Um, that is not necessarily always going to be the case. And there will come a point at which the ICO just says, no, we're not. We, we've had enough you're not having another reprimand you're just having a fine because you haven't behaved yourself so in terms of your contracts with them you do still need these clauses in there and you do need, still need to think about these points because you know yes we've got reprimands as a kind of intermediate stage now but that doesn't mean that the potential for a fine has vanished yeah and and on the um the sort of prior point i suppose pushback to the processor could be well yes um parties might be directly liable um but there are you know, it is this point of there are other types of loss so um the a party the, the individual concerned may not uh, bring a, cl a claim for compensation under the data protection legislation but uh the the processor who has failed to um, put in place appropriate technical and organizational measures in breach of their contractual obligations to do so um may then uh, cause the the customer to need to incur cost um making sure that actually that that situation is uh, is rectified um and it it's it's thinking about other types of liability other than just uh, liability to data subjects although it is also fair to say that one party can off can um in relation to data subjects bear the bear the brunt of the the claim for compensation by the data subject where the other party does have some level of fault um and so there can be a right to claim compensation from your processor um, when having compensated the data subject where some of that fault has arisen from fault of the processor. Um, 
a couple of very quick points. The, a couple of people have asked where the Cabinet Office stroke government legal department guidance as to caps can be found. Is there a link we can circulate to, to the source of that? It certainly easily. is. It's, it's on the gov.uk website. Um, and if you search for the model services contract, um, that would be a, that would be a good starting point to get to um, the guidance. It's, it's in the government, um, the cabinet office and government legal department publish a number of uh, contracts. So there is the model services contract, there is a mid tier contract, and then there is a short form contract. And all of them have uh, associated guidance on the data protection breach point and liability cap. Thank you. So I'll do, try and do two more, one hopefully quite short, and then one slightly more lengthy and technical question, but that was from an anonymous person, so we won't be able to follow up. So we'll try and answer it now. Um, generally, regarding joint controller relationships, have we seen the ICO proactively investigating which joint controller is actually responsible for a particular loss, or do they lump them together? Maybe, Claire, is that for you? Yeah, so that'll be for me. Um, bearing in mind that joint controllership is actually a pretty rare thing in reality, because you have to have two controllers who are deciding both the purposes and means of processing over the same data set. So it's you know not always, it doesn't happen all that often. So we actually haven't seen any investigations with joint controllers where they would need to apportion liability for particular losses. Um, but you know, um, generally, we we find that in most cases where there has been some sort of data incident, the contracts are all very clear, even though occasionally sometimes wrong, um, that one party is a controller and one party is a processor. That's how people have generally set themselves up. But as Paul did say earlier, you know, the, the ICO has to find the one that's actually responsible. So if we did have a situation where there were joint controllers, then you would be able to expect the ICO to be digging to work out who they're supposed to find because the last thing they want is to get caught up in drawn out litigation as to who really it was yeah okay um i think we'll probably as as we're getting now into <laughs> 45 minutes we, we'll try and uh, wind up um to, to the anonymous attendee who asked a question uh early on about receiving personal data from an organization outside the uk eu which uh where they don't have their own gdpr compliant laws um did not quite the what was touched on in today's uh, seminar could you let us know your name or email us with that question and we'll we'll do our best to answer that uh, but i don't think we've got time um for now i do apologize uh, and for uh, everyone else so well um we there are a number of 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 other questions hopefully we've covered quite a lot of it but but anything uh, certainly for anyone who has, has let us know their name we will uh, try and answer your queries uh, following on from this Paul and Claire, anything more from you? No. Good. Well, I think so. we are we are done. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. At, at the high point, we had about 509 people attending, which is probably almost a record for us or maybe the record. So thank you so much for, for coming in. It is a very topical, ever-changing and very relevant relevant subject for, for us all. So, so thank you for coming. Um, there will be, I believe, and I'll be uh, corrected uh, by by Kate, uh, who, who's there in the background, who can tell me if I'm wrong. But I think when as you log out, there'll be a sort of form you get taken to. And so we would really appreciate your feedback on on how we did further on what topics uh, you'd like to hear more about. Yes, you completed the poll, but any other more specific thoughts that would be um tremendous but but otherwise thank you so much for attending i hope you found it interesting i i as a non-data expert certainly did uh, thank you very much enjoy the rest of your days